Today's Bible reading comes from Revelations chapter 6 and 7 and we'll be reading certain verses from these chapters. Um, You can find the commencement um, of the reading on page 994 of your Bibles or you might just want to follow the slides. So we're starting off at Revelation 6 verses 1 to 4. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Verses 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed, just as they had been. Verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. Verses 15 to 17. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east. Having the seal of the living God, he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Verse 9. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Verses 11 to 12. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Verses 14 to 17. I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they that have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb of the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Good morning. Uh, My name's Martin. If you're a visitor, no, I'm not a pastor here. I am, uh, we're part of the region. Miriam and I visit different churches as part of the region. We have a ministry to the region. And, uh, but we come here at night and we love being part of Wagga Baptist. Um, So that's my introduction. Let me, yes, here we go. That's where we're going today. And I'm going to stop and pray. Our Father, as we come to your word, I pray that you'd speak to us. Pray, Lord, that where we're downtrodden and and weary and despairing, that you'd pick us up. 
Pray, Lord, that we'd feel your comfort and your kindness. Pray, Lord, where we need to repent and uh, look to you more, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see that clearly. Give us hearts that are soft. Don't let us be hard-hearted, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as we, we look through you, these chapters, that we'd be filled with the joy of trust in you and knowing that our, cer- our future is certain. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bible open, that's a great start. Keep it open because you'll need it. You, you will be needing it. Um, This is where we're going. I'll leave you a second to read it. This is where we're going. Unless, of course, I get carried away and then we'll cut a few things and add a few things, but this is the general plan. I love The Lord of the Rings. And when I'm in the car by myself, I'm allowed to listen to The Lord of the Rings audiobook. Any of Lord of the Rings fans? There were two and a half this morning at eight o'clock. Let's go again. Any Lord of the Rings fans? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. We'll put you down for two, Chuck. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Claire? <laughs> Sixteen. Well, Lord of the Rings is awesome. It's awesome. And um but it's a worrying tale. You're meant to worry. You're meant to think, oh, no, what's going to happen? Oh, no, what's going to happen? What is happening? What is happening? Are they going to get out of this alive? Um, Miriam and I went to the Lord of the Rings movie. It was such a good movie. It's such a big screen. And it's big. Everything's big and dark and scary. And you think, oh, is the character Frodo going to be okay? He's got the ring around his neck. He's going to be okay. And then these four horses, the four, the, I think there's seven horses or six I don't know. Nine. Thank you. Who said that? Nine. Thank you, Raph. Nine horses and they're dark. They've got steel shoes. Steel shoes, they spark up and uh, the riders, there to kill. And they're, they're chasing Frodo. And they, go, they make this noise. They go. And Miriam says to me, we've got to go. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I've paid $15 each and I'm at a movie that I want to watch. But we're going. It's too gary. It's too gary. I must admit, we walked out of Gremlins on our honeymoon because I was too scared, so I shouldn't be too cranky about it. But the point is, it's a scary movie. You don't know if it's going to go okay or if it's going to be a disaster. What's in it? Well, there are elves, there are dwarves, there are orcs, there are orc armies. There are cavalry charges with all these horses and knights and all this banging and clashing, and you don't know who's going to win. There's people riding wolves, and you don't know if they're going to get the baddies. There's goodies who get killed. There's goodies who survive. There's small people who do something victorious. There's people who are brave. There's traitors. There's people who are strangers who become friends. It's people who are strangers who never get any closer, even though they spend heaps of time together. There's attacks. There's fortresses that are attacked and defeated. There's fortresses that that stand. There's brave people. There's cowards. I've already told you about that. There's horses. There's bows and arrows. There's swords. There's shields. There's people with magical swords that glow green when there's orcs around, which is when you hit the panic button. It's terribly exciting, and you don't know if they're going to win or lose. There's a giant spider that eats people, and you think, oh no, are the the goodies going to get eaten? And is the whole story going to unravel? Well, Revelations is similar. (laughs) It's similar in that it's big. It's not, Revelations is not like a normal letter in the New Testament where you read it as a, as a letter, as a letter you'd receive, as normal prose. It's a m- series of pictures. It's meant to make you go, ah! Oh! So if you're sitting there thinking, oh yeah, okay, four horses, um, swords, shields, scale. No, you missed the point. The whole point is you're meant to go, ah! Oh! You're meant to go, ah! Oh! 
John is going, oh, he sees these things happening. Going past him, he thinks, oh, no, what is happening? That's what I want you to pick up. I want you to pick up that. But it's different in another way, important way. Lord of the Rings, you don't know who's going to win. It's this pitch battle, pitch battle. The goodies win, the baddies win. A terrible tragedy happens and they regroup and you don't know what's going to happen. I read the book every year for about 10 years, so I know what's going to happen. But you don't know. As you're watching the movie or reading the book, you don't know what's going to happen. And if, you, if you've forgotten what's happening, you go, oh, what's happening again? You don't know where it's winning, what's going to happen. But in Revelation, Jesus is victorious in the first chapter. He's victorious in the last chapter. Do you catch that? That's the big difference. Jesus is victorious in the first chapter and the last chapter. He is victorious. There's nothing to worry about. I've got my iPad on the wrong side. I just have to adjust. There you go. Okay. That's the introduction. Topical and textual introduction next. That's on the screen. The book of Revelations was written to seven real churches in real towns in, in uh, the left side, the right side of Turkey, as you're looking at the map, on the water side of Turkey. Seven real churches. They were in a culture that was dominated by Rome, dominated by high taxation, dominated by lack of, um, lack of um, sympathy for Christians. You know, in Australia, to be Australian, apparently you're meant to drink beer and go to the cricket. In New Zealand, to be a New Zealander, you're meant to go to, to the rugby and, and farm sheep. In Turkey, you're meant to go to the temple and you're meant to sacrifice to idols. That's what you're meant to do. It's just that simple. To be part of the culture was to do these things. But Christians were doing something different and they were getting thrashed. The, in the letter so far, we've ha- been told in chapter 2 that, that they need to persevere. They've been told they need to persevere. They're getting thumped. They're warned of imprisonment and suffering death. Antipas, poor Antipas has already been killed. These churches are struggling to oppose heresy. There's heresy creeping in and they're struggling to oppose it. It's a real place. It's a real situation. There have been heresies. There's heresy. There's immoral teaching and immoral behavior. And it's a real problem. That's the place where this letter is landing. And we get to look over their shoulder and read their mail. We see behind the physical world, we're told to stay faithful to Jesus We're told to persevere through hard times and we're told to look forward to the new heaven and new earth. I read a book this week and the guy said, if you're reading Revelations, you've got to feel it. You've got to feel it. You've got to let yourself get into the story. It's designed to be experienced, not analysed. You can put it into a spreadsheet. You can chop it up into about 50 or 60 bits, but you won't feel it. Apo- apocalyptic literature is meant to be felt as well. It's meant to be felt. And I'd encourage you to understand the, the images and what's happening and get a feeling for what's happening. You've got the introduction. I'll just start. Four horses. Verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say, that the four living creatures we were introduced in last chapter, big, think big and powerful. The first of the four living creatures, so the Lamb opens the seal. The living creature says, look, says, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. He's going to go out and take over stuff, beat stuff down, beat people down. The scroll is like a legal scroll. It, it's a, a, for, a formal letter or an official letter. That's the sort of feel it's meant to have. As a primary school teacher, for years and years, at the end of term, you get a whole accumulation of kids' artwork. And you think, what are we going to do with it? Do we chuck it in the bin or do we send it home? We've got to send it home, right? We've got to send it home. So I used to make the kids line up, put it all in a pile, roll it up, and put three bits of sticky tape on it. And that was their scroll to take home. And when they got home, they would undo the 
undo the seals, the bits of sticky tape, and then you take it, open it up, put it on the wall. What we have here is a little bit more, a little bit more formal, a lot more formal than that. It's a scroll that God the Father gives to the Lamb, and the Lamb opens it. It's a, it's God's purposes and plans for the future. The horse. The horse is not a horsey horse. It's a big horse, a powerful horse, and the rider is there for destruction and conquest. It's not a good picture. A while ago, I don't like horses, particularly. A while ago, I was given a. I was out. We were out in the Ute. We were there to rescue someone who'd got bogged, and we had to go through this paddock and the, to get to them. And they, there were some horses behind the gate, and I was sent out as the passenger to push the horses back. Easy job. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. Just go push the horses back. I couldn't. The horses were in grass this long. They could see grass this long. And it was raining. It was cold. It was after dark. I was freezing, getting rained on. I'm trying to push these horses back. And they're pushing me through the gate. I'm pushing back, pushing me through the gate. And they swing their heads. And they try and get you. And I thought, oh, I was tired. And I was cold. And I was wet. And I was scared. And I had to be rescued. It was one of the most indignant, not indignant, undignified parts of my life. I had to get rescued. Person who comes over, oh, come on, this is... Uh, 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 and I had to get in the car and drive through the gate. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at something stage up from there. We're looking at big, wild horses that are riding out for destruction and war. What happens in the next... Oh. Notice that the lamb opens the seal... His servant, the creature, says, come, and the, the writer comes. It's all under God's control. It's not out of control. God is not out of control. It's not as if God has lost the reins or lost the car keys and everything's going mad. It's not like that. It's all part of God's plan. Well, these horses, I think they have two roles. They bring judgment to humanity that rejects God. And through the suffering they cause, it helps us as believers cling tighter to God. I think it helps us to cling tighter to God. Well, the first horse is a white horse. Conquest. The second horse is a fiery red horse. Its rider was given, verse 4, power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. That is not a good sign. Large sword. It appears that this is a fair reflection on what's happening in the world and what's been happening for a while, violence and death. Then the third horse is introduced, a black horse. Can't be getting any better. White, red, black, like they're not happy colours like green and blue, orange, for your soccer team. No, no, no. Verse 6, Then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not harm the oil and the wine. The point is, a worker, so we've had conquest. And the sword to take away peace. Now we've got famine and hardship. A worker spent, the the message is a worker spends their whole day's wage, gets paid at five o'clock in the afternoon and goes and buys the wheat to make bread for their family for that night. Goes to work for the day, gets paid at five o'clock. That's how it worked for these guys. Buy their food, go home. They're close, close to the wind. They can't escape poverty. If they're sick, no one eats. If they lose their job, no one eats. If they can't get to work for the day, no one eats. It's a big problem. So there's hardship going on, trapped in poverty, never getting ahead, and yet there's this interesting thing about the rich, the oil and the olive oil and the wine, which some some commentators th- seem to think that it's saying that the rich sometimes miss out on some awful things in life, that the poor will suffer, and the rich some some of them will be excused from these things just because of their wealth. Well, it continues, doesn't get any better. The fourth horse is introduced. I looked, verse eight. And there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following along behind it. 
They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. Bringing death. Bringing death. This is serious. As John's watching this, he must have been thinking, oh, no. But he's seeing it. Hades and death. Hades was traditionally thought of as a place of like the grave or the dead who didn't love the Lord. But I'm not going to go on about that. Death and Hades. The lamb breaks the seal and this horse comes out. Death. The thing is, Jesus is still in charge of death and Hades. Jesus has victory over the grave. Jesus died and rose. So don't think, oh no, this thing is out of control. It's, it's something rolling down the hill that's just going to crash. It's not like that. It's under God's control. It's under God's control. The first four, four horses seem to work together. They seem to have a, a, a work together. They seem to be a commentary on what God, God has allowed. Judgment. And it picks up some of the themes that come up in Daniel and Ezekiel, where there's sets of four terrible things. Well, I'd like you to also notice that these judgments, often they come through people, the wars, poverty, famine. A lot of that's caused by us. So we are part of, part of our problems as well. But know that God is pro-justice, pro-righteousness. He is. He's pro-justice. He's pro-righteousness. That's why he's dealing with it. Well, got to keep remembering what, who this, who's receiving this letter. It's going to a church that's being thrashed, that's under pressure from Rome, under pressure from the local idols and the local culture. They're under pressure. People have even been killed. They're under pressure. Suffering is part of the deal for us as believers. And the whole world suffers because we've stepped out of the Genesis 1 life to the Genesis 3 life where we reject God. We're out of the garden. Nero has been persecuting Christians in the 60s. Domitian did a really good job in the 80s to mid-90s. Christians got it. Christians got it. The funny thing is, as Christians suffer, they cling harder to Jesus. They cling harder to Jesus. That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to cling to Jesus. In 1 Peter, Peter says, In all this you greatly rejoice, talking about suffering, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, may, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Our suffering not only draws us to God, but proves that our faith is true and it brings glory to God. It's not a small thing. Well, these horses have been introduced. You should be feeling exhausted. John was feeling exhausted after the four horses. He must have thought, ah, oh, can it get any worse? Can it get any more serious and scary? Well, let's have a look at this next little section. There's a call for justice. Seal number five is a call for justice. Verse nine. When he, the lamb, opened the fifth seal, so it's all at the lamb's hands, or hoofs, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. He sees a picture of people who love the Lord who've been killed in the temple under the altar. They're safe there. How, and they say... How long, fair question, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? These are people who have been killed for their faith. They say, how long? How long are you going to let it run? Here's the answer. Have a look at the answer. Verse 11 is part of the answer. The answer is answered over a few stages. Then each of them was given a white robe. So they say, how long, O Lord, before you deal with injustice? How long, O Lord, before you deal with the, the people who've killed us? And the answer is, here's your white robe. 
It's actually more important that they're related to Jesus and they're righteous before Jesus than their, answer, their question gets answered exactly. They get given a white robe. That's cool. A white robe. And they're told to wait a little longer until a full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. They're told, white robe, righteous before God, and they're told others will be dying too. So the answer to how long is white robe, close to God, righteous, white, pure. God sees you as pure. That's pretty good, isn't it? God sees you, if you love the Lord Jesus, as pure. And wait a little while longer because there's other people going to suffer. Well, the answer continues. John watched as the Lamb opened the fifth, sixth seal. This seal continues to answer the question about how long. It continues to answer that question. Wow, have a look at this. There's earthquakes, moon turns to blood, stars fall to the earth, the heavens roll up, mountains and islands removed. The whole joint goes to pieces. The whole joint goes to pieces. I'm not sure if it's a scientific discussion. I suspect it's a literary way, a vision to help us understand the calamity of it all. The whole world that we think is secure, like I walk on a mountain, I think I'm safe. I walk along a road, I think there's nothing to worry me here. But the whole world is no longer a safe place. God's judgment, the stars, the earth, the, the heavens all rolled up. Mountains, islands, boom, gone. And it picks up the Old Testament ideas of the day of the Lord and God's judgment. You can find that in Joel, Amos, Zechariah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Hosea and Micah, just to start you off. It's a picture of absolute disaster. The whole place is gone. It's the Lamb's plan. So let's stay cool and just, just keep, our, keep our finger in the page for a minute. But it causes panic. The panic button is pushed. Who's panicking? Well, there's people going to caves. This is a vision. So you've got to understand that it might not be a video but it's meant to help you understand what's happening. So people going to caves saying to the caves, fall on me so the lamb doesn't get at me. Fall on me so I don't have to face the lamb. Do you catch how big that is? Panic. Who's doing this? It's the kings, the princes, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else. All the people who are harassing the Christians are panicking. For great, verse 17, is the, for the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand it? Who can stand it? That's the next question. Who can stand it? Who can stand it? The seal reminds us that Jesus is judge. So the question, how long will you take before you do something about injustice? The Lamb's answer is basically, I will judge. I will deal with injustice. Injustice won't be allowed to go on like a train forever. Jesus says, through this, he will judge. And so those saints who are under the altar, they had a fair question. What will you do about this? And Jesus says, I will judge. I will judge. And it's the lamb who's judging. He wants, Jesus wants us to not only follow him, but to acknowledge that he's Lord, he's creator, and come to him. He wants all of us. Well, who's safe? It sound, like, it's precarious. It sounds a bit precarious to me, but this next little section is beautiful. Have a look at verse 1, uh, chapter 7. We're now into chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or, or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel come out from the east, having the seal of the living God. So another seal. He caught... It's, it's, it's an instrument used for putting a mark on, on people or books or things. When you uh, lend books, you write your name in them, right? You write your name in the book. Here we've got a picture of the seal saying, it's mine. But the seal is put on people. He called out in a loud voice to the, 
He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And he says in verse 3, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. All this stuff is happening. All this stuff, all this, this uncertainty, all this drama. But God says, don't let it happen until we put a seal on the believers' heads so that they are safe. Does God care about you in all the crazy things that happen in life? He does. He does. He knows you. He knows you personally. He knows you individually. This is Jesus saying, I care and I know my people. I know my people. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing to think about. Well, their concerns are addressed. Jesus says, I'll seal them. And I think he's basically saying that he'll help them overcome. He'll help them overcome. He'll help them to stay faithful. Remember the situation of the churches? They're getting thrashed, but they're also bailing and they're also uh, letting heresy in. He says, I will help you. I will help you stay close to me. I'll help you remain faithful. This section... I was thinking about this section as the music team was leading us in worship. It was beautiful. Thank you so much for the music team. And thank you so much for everyone who's been helping put together the service, this morning's service. I had tears in my eyes thinking about what we were singing about, the Lord Jesus reigning, defeating death. It is such good news. Such good news. Here we are in verse 9. Have a look at verse 9. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and in the front of the Lamb, they were wearing white clothes, keep an eye on that white clothes, and were holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Where does our safety and salvation come from? The Lamb and God the Father. Where does our sal- salvation come from? Who do we, do we save ourselves? No, no, it's because Jesus died and rose again. That keeps coming back time and time again. It should give us power to be confident in Jesus. And what color of pants are they wearing and shirts? White, 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 white. It's beautiful. We're going to come back to it. So I'm not finished with white. White. And they're holding palm branches. Remember on the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and everyone's singing Hosanna? They're all waving palm branches. It's beautiful. The king, the king, the king. There are huge crowds in heaven. I sus- anyway, music team was so beautiful. Huge crowds in heaven. Singing, singing, singing. Move forward a few verses to chapter, to verse uh, 11 and 12. All the angels were standing, so the, 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 the believers in white had been singing. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne of God, before the throne and worshipped God, saying. So the believers have been calling out praise. And that starts off the elders and the the elders, the 24 elders and the creatures. They start praising. They throw themselves on the floor to praise God. What an incredible, incredible response of the heart. They throw themselves on the floor. I think I'm, I just the whole body, the whole being is captured by God's brilliance. And what do they say? They say, Amen. We agree. Pra- ready to count with your fingers? All primary school kids, ready? Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. How many? Oh, good. You're good. Okay, we could do it like this. It'd still be the same. Seven. It's the perfect number. Remember how children talked about it to us last week or the week before? Remember that? You meant to go, yes. Yes, we remember that. It's beautiful. And what do they say? Praise and glory. Is God worthy of praise and glory? Is he wise? Do we truly believe he's wise? Do we truly trust him because he knows best? Does he get our thanks? Does he deserve our thanks? Do we see ourselves as self-made people, or lucky, 
Or do we see everything that good that, we come, that comes to us is from God's hand? Good question. Does he deserve honour? Or do we honour ourselves or other people? Do we believe that he's powerful and has all strength? Do we believe in our lives that he has enough power and strength to, to help us? Do we really believe that? That's what he's saying. It's magnificent stuff. It is just, it makes me want to call the music team up. It's just awesome. Okay, we continue. A few more things. Verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? It's a, it's a Dorothy Dixa question where you, you already know the answer. And he says, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made their, them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. They started off black. They put it into the red. They turned white. It's magnificent. It's magnificent. Their robes are white. That is a reflect, that's an image of how God sees them. How does God see you? Does God see you as a broken down person who's just doing their best? No! He sees you as white if you believe in Him. He sees you as white. Do you catch that? It's awesome. I have a favourite red shirt, which was inspired by David. David had a red shirt, and I thought, I want a red shirt too. So I bought a red shirt at RB Sellers, and I was out changing the toe ball on the, on the car, and I got all this grease on it. My favourite red shirt. And I said to him, and I didn't say anything to Miriam, I just put it in the wash. And then Miriam said to me, you know that red shirt, it's now a work shirt. I said, it's, what do you mean? It's got grease on it. I said, well, can't we get it rid of it? Can't we scrub it? I'll scrub it. She said, if you scrub it, you'll just wreck it. And then I thought, maybe I could put bleach in it. <laughs> but then it reminded me of the time I put bleach in with the towels. And I um, can't do it. Anyway, so we're going to soak it apparently. But what's happened is, I've begun all messy and I can't do a thing about it. Can't do a thing about it. But you know what happened with me when I met the Lord and the Lord's blood worked in my life? Messy Martin became white. White. We've all become from messy, whoever you are, grey, black, brown, green, green on your knees. We're white. We're white before the Lord because the Lord has washed us clean. See yourself as white. Don't see yourself as a light shade of grey or a light pink or a light yellow. See yourself as white because Jesus has made you white. He has washed you clean. Let me finish up. Verse 15, they're before the throne. They're safe. They serve God day and night in His temple. They're never away from Him. How awful. Awesome. How awesome, sorry. Awesome. Awesome. They're there with God all the time. They're not separated from God. They're close and they're safe. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Isn't that nice being near someone who, who you, you trust and you sh they shelter you? That's what happens for kids. When kids are near their mum and except teenagers, when kids are near their mums and dads, they're safe. They know that everything's going to be okay. That's the feeling. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat on them, nor any scorching heat. They're safe and they're satisfied. This is a picture of your future. Your future with the Lord. For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. Here's a gag. It's a gag. It's, a, it's an irony. It's a, you're meant to think about it. The Lamb is your shepherd. The Lamb. We think little Lamb. In this case, it's big Lamb. Is your shepherd who cares for you. He will lead them to springs of living water. Isn't that beautiful? Springs of living water. He cares and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wipe away every tear. This is a vision of how God is dealing with the problems of the world. How he has solved the problem, the central problem through Jesus' death and resurrection. And the blood that washes us clean. As we finish, I want to ask you a couple of questions. How's your praise and glory going? How's your commitment to God's wisdom going? How's your thanking God and honouring God? 
And how's your belief in God being powerful and strong? It's a good thing. I actually managed to memorize them. You can memorize them, these seven things. The Lamb is is magnificent. The Lamb is magnificent. That's what you're meant to get out of this. You're meant to see the Lamb is magnificent. You're also meant to remember that you, who started off in grubby clothes, can be washed white. And if you love the Lord, you are washed white. Washed white! You can still go outside and play in the mud, but you're still white. It's awesome. I want you also to remember the wrath of the Lamb and the beauty of life with the Lamb. It's an interesting choice. And it's put there, it's there in the text in front of us. The wrath of the Lamb and the beauty of life with the Lamb. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see your beauty, your power, your glory, your wisdom, your your honour. Help us to thank you. Help us to see and be in love with your power and your strength and be confident in you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see that we're washed white. Help us, Lord, to live in that. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand the joy of knowing you. And Lord, as we sing and reflect on you and as we go out the rest of our our day, I pray, Lord, that you would keep us coming back to who you are, the Lamb who saves us. Amen.